Uber gives up on China, sheep with solar vests, how cord cutters can watch the Olympics, and the saga of the chip card. All that and a whole lot more coming up on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1567, recorded Monday, August 1st, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Rocket Mortgage brings the mortgage process into the 21st century with a fast, easy, and completely online process. Check out Rocket Mortgage today at quickenloans.com slash TNT. And by Tracker, a coin-sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit thetracker.com right now and enter promo code TNT for 30% off your entire order. And by Trunk Club. Get clothes that fit and look amazing without ever stepping into a store. Again, Trunk Club will help you create the wardrobe you've always dreamed of with your own personal stylist. Go to trunkclub.com slash TNT and join Trunk Club today. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we point fingers at you and talk you. about the tech news. And we talk about it with people who are passionate about technology. I am Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. I suddenly feel very bad for pointing my finger at the viewers. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry no, that I pointed nice, at you. It was a hey there. It was like, ha ha, with the little the handgun things, <laughs> which is just super cheesy. But hey, what can I say? It's a Monday. I feel weird yeah, today. No, Yeah, I like it. I, I think right. we should incorporate is, it into every show. Yes, it's part of our new identity. Cheesy TNT with the finger thing, and we go <laughs> like bang, that. bang. Okay. I love it. All right, should we uh, start with the tech news? Yeah, games? I think we should. <laughs> the Chinese ride-hailing market is a tough nut to crack, and Uber admitted defeat today by selling its China business to its rival, Didi Chuxing. In fact, America's operating Americans operating any truly successful Internet business in China has been a trick that no company has yet to pull off effectively. Bloomberg reports that despite heavy spending and a keen interest in succeeding on the part of Uber CEO Travis Kalanick, Uber could not compete and sold its Chinese subsidiary to Didi, thereby creating a new company worth about $35 billion. Didi says they'll operate Uber China as a separate brand. Yeah. So, yeah, this is interesting. Um, this is kind of a monopoly. I mean, the two companies were uh, just losing money because they were competing with each other and lowering prices to, you know, a, a way that neither of them were going to succeed. So, joining together is beneficial for both of them, but not necessarily beneficial for the consumers, but it's China. Yeah, I don't know. I kind of see it as a little bit of a defeat for Uber. Uber really had plans to dominate in China and for the past two years has basically been saying we are going to do this. Uh, and so for them to kind of, you know, let go of their brand, their business, their their data to China just feels to me like like Uber just had to do it. Uh, Didi was just too strong of a, a fortress to overcome in China. Um Sources say that Uber has lost around $2 billion in China in the past two years. And so really, you know, a big part of this is kind of investors pushing for the deal. If Uber ever wants to have, a, you know, an IPO of some sort, this is a big hurdle that they had to overcome. So maybe through this deal, it, you know, it, it might be somewhat of a defeat, but maybe in the long term that enables Uber to kind of get that IPO uh, out of the way and get it going. I think so. Investors in Uber China will own 20% of uh, DD. So, I mean, that's not bad. Um, you know, Google, Facebook, Twitter, they've all tried to um, operate in China and mm -hmm. they've been unable to. And we always talk about that because so much of their business is um, is censored. You know, it's, it's about content that is censored in China. So, you know, you look at Uber and you think, OK, well, what, what's wrong with that? And I mean, Uber is a great place. Uh, China is a great place for Uber. They have the big, most quickly growing middle class of any place. I mean, there's a lot of people there that want this service. So, yeah, it's uh, I guess if you cared about Uber, you'd be sad that they didn't succeed. <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, you know, it's not good news for Lyft because now they yeah. can start focusing more on the um, other market where they really can compete with Lyft. Exactly. That frees them up to really focus on taking down Lyft in the U.S., taking down uh, Ola in uh, India. There's Grab in Southeast Asia. All these markets where Uber really has a, let's say a fighting chance versus China, which was really an uphill battle and they were losing billions in the process. And, he's, you know, speaking of Lyft, um, a couple of months ago, Lyft and Didi actually struck a cross-platform deal 
that was basically it was basically this deal where if Chinese travelers traveled to the U.S., they could still use the the app that they're used to using, the Didi app, in order to summon Lyft drivers and vice versa. And I wonder if this is going to be a deal that at some point in the near future, Lyft sees pull, you know, that rug pulled out from underneath them and yet another defeat to Uber, basically. Yeah, I don't know. And of course, Apple's uh, made a big investment in DD too. So mm -hmm. I don't know where that stands. But I think Uber is just really poised to, I mean, I think their plan is to take on mass transportation uh, to really have driverless, you know, driverless Ubers is mm -hmm. what the future is. Um, and I want driverless cars, but I don't necessarily know if I want driverless Ubers. I want my own driverless car. <laughs> All of them to be driverless. Yes. Uh, and no pedestrians. Elon <laughs> Musk has big plans for what he sees as the future of Tesla. And not only is he busy working on the things that would speed autonomous vehicle technology onto the roads, but he's also focused on how those electric vehicles get their power. And beyond that, how all of, all of his efforts kind of work in concert together. On that note, today, Tesla announced that it has agreed to buy Solar City. And that's the solar company that up until recently, Elon Musk has actually, he's owned a stake in. So it's not like he's been totally hands off uh, with Solar City. I think a 20% stake, uh, though it's currently led by his cousin, Lyndon Rive. Uh, Musk first floated this idea publicly on the Tesla blog back in June. Musk says that the two companies should have always been one and that this move will allow the company to realize its ambitions of a unified and efficient future of powering Tesla's products with solar energy. This seemed, I mean, this, this whole deal really seemed like a not if, but when sort of thing. And now, you know, given that, um, you know, that, that the higher ups, the powers that be allow this to go through and I'm not entirely sure why that wouldn't happen. It seems like it's going to happen. Yeah, it's a one-stop shop for clean energy. So <laughs> pretty much. Um, I think it's clearing a big obstacle for Elon Musk. Like this was, you know, to to have to not have to deal with a bunch of different, you know, ways to get power. I think that uh, that's great for them. It still needs to be approved. So, mm -hmm. like you said, we don't know if it's going to be approved. And Tesla announces earnings on Wednesday. So um, I guess this is why this announcement is happening now. Oh yeah, and you can be sure that we're probably going to hear at least some more of that on the earnings call. Then, you know, a little bit from his. Uh, uh, from his own words, although he did speak a little bit about this after after the announcement. Basically, what the, what they're talking about here, just kind of like the vision, the vision that Elon Musk has here. So you've got the Tesla Power Wall and the Power Pack. Those are the home batteries that Tesla unveiled, I think, a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, that gets energy from the solar city panels that are on the house, the power grid as well. That can store the energy, you know, ex any extra energy overnight or for cloudy days, that sort of stuff. But the thought would be to make car batteries inside the Teslas work along those same lines and just have it all work seamlessly together. Uh, it's, it's a perfect pit fit for kind of the big vision that, you know, Elon Musk has always had for these companies. The challenge is, I mean, neither company, you know, they're both, <laughs> neither of them is profitable basically. And so there's a lot of, of kind of, um, I don't know, you, you have to put a lot of faith in what Elon's vision of the future is for these companies. And, ho and I, you know, I guess it remains to be seen whether investors are willing to give him even more runway, even more faith to that future before you finally get it profitable and working mm. together. Mm, we will see. Yeah. Addie Robertson from The Verge writes that New York Governor Mario Cuomo has banned sex offenders from playing Pokemon Go and other, quote, similar games. Lawmakers are afraid that sex offenders will use the game's lures to attract children, as has happened in a few cases where people were robbed while playing the game. So far, there have been no known cases of sexual predators using the game Pokemon Go in this way. Uh, Cuomo has sent an open letter to Pokemon Go creator Niantic to help prevent the use of this and similar games by people on the sex offender registry, uh, these kinds of limits, Robertson writes, aren't necessarily new. New York's Electronic Security and Targeting of Online Predators Act already requires offenders to send all email accounts and screen name names, and they forward them to social media companies to purge the sex offenders' accounts. So, ah, gosh, this is this is a tough one <laughs> because I don't know. I mean, I to to ban all sex all people on the sex offender registry from playing internet connected games seems like a, a far way to go. I mean, I, I I would rather them be playing internet connected games than other things they might have done in the past. I don't. I, they, this comes from two lawmakers found fifty nine Pokemon near sex offenders homes. Um, so I don't know. Um, what do you yeah. think? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I mean. 
obviously understand the intention of this, right? And it's a sticky situation all around. A lot of a lot of kids playing this game. This is a game that takes them from the kind of comfortable confines of a home and pushes them out into the scary real world. Uh, and I say that in air quotes for audio listeners. <laughs> um, I just don't know how you enforce this. I mean, I know that, um, the, so the Division of Criminal Justice Services in New York has sent 52,000 records on almost 19,000 sex offenders to 40 tech companies every week. So that's updated every single week for, to all of those 40 tech companies for the purging of their accounts from social networks. Like, I don't know how you ban them other than making some sort of a deal directly with Niantic, which is part of the plan um, to, I don't know, get that, you know, get the game and get Niantic to automatically monitor that list and reject people of, you know, the, the email addresses that match the list. But I mean, fake Gmail accounts exist. It's a thing. I don't know how you. I don't know how you enforce this. Yeah. But but I but I understand obviously the the reasons behind it, and I think anyone can get behind that. Right. But I've been taking it from just Pokemon Go to right. any internet connected yeah, it game. Really opens it up. That's when you just start to think, okay, like this is a slippery slope. Like mm -hmm, let's sure. all reel in our Pokemon Go paranoia for a minute. Um, you know, and read Addie Robertson's article, by all means, if you're interested in reading more about this, because she goes into, uh, you know, about the sex offender registry, whether, you know, it was designed for prevention, not punishment. And there's no no saying that it actually does prevent uh, mm. prevent any further, you know, pre sexual predatory predator. action. Yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, it's, it's an interesting, uh, I don't know, the Pokemon Go story is continues to just go down every little step in our it really does. It just <laughs> won't, Pokemon Go just won't go away. <laughs> Seriously. When's it going to go away? I mean, people stop playing it, but we still t start talking about, like, all the aspects <laughs> of our lives. Well, and, and I think in the, you know, in the general kind of confines of the technology sphere and news and stuff like that, it's really quieted down, right? Like, things have really slowed down. But yet you... In the, in the world of government and stuff like that, it's still this thing that's easy to latch on to. So while you understand the intentions of this and, and it, you know, it, it kind of does feel like the, the so commonly used think of the children thing where you take this thing that's really hot and really, you know, has a lot of eyeballs on it already and then you kind of turn it into this issue uh, that you really want extra support and backing for. You understand the intentions, you understand the motives behind it, but is it really practical? Is it really that possible to enforce something as wide ranging and broad like this? Like you said, Slippery Slope is a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. The Xbox Summer Update is rolling out today to users of the Xbox One and it's packing a feature that's been in the preview version since early June. Cortana. This means that gamers have a more flexible voice control platform baked in, which can allow them to do things like add gaming friends into a game hands-free while they're playing, as well as the standard stuff like, you know, simply turning on the Xbox with their voice. Gamers can use the headset that they might already be wearing, as well as the Kinect uh, that they have plugged in if they do to issue those voice commands on the fly. And yeah, I think, I think the the sentiment from people who have been playing around, because this has been out in like in the like the preview version for the last couple of months, started with oh my goodness, you know this you know super underpowered, underfeatured or whatever, and I don't know if it's a good replacement for what was there. To now, it seems like people are like you know what I get it, I understand it, and as it gets more powerful, uh, this is this is a really good fit. I would talk to my Xbox if I had an Xbox. <laughs> you would or you wouldn't? I would. Okay, I yeah. would. But you I, don't have an Xbox. I so. don't. So you're just going to shut up to your Xbox that you don't have. Yes. Yeah, me too, because I don't have one either. Right. <laughs> but I would. Um, yeah, so obviously it's it's going to be good. And it's going to be good for Microsoft and their Cortana numbers because there are a lot of Xbox users out there who suddenly automatically, I have to imagine, are going to be factored into any of those usage. You know, the system, learning from the usage, all that kind of stuff. They've really opened up the platform for Cortana in that way. While the Faroe Islands has more sheep than it does people, and maybe that's why they got sick of waiting for Google Street View to map their remote lands, they decided to take matters into their own hands and create Sheep View 360. That's right, the Faroe Islands Tourism Board equipped local sheep with 360 degree cameras and tiny solar panel vests that send back the GPS coordinates so that they can be uploaded to Google Street View. If you want to help spread the word, use We Want Google Street View, use that hashtag. Uh, so, yeah, they really want Google Street View very badly. That is awesome. Uh, I love Google Sheep View. <laughs> I'm thinking someday Google Camel Camera and possibly Google Alpaca Picture. 
<laughs> I don't know. I'm just thinking of other regions that can put this technology to use. I love it, though. It's awesome. This is so cool. Mm -hmm. I don't have much more to say about it, but no, it's neat. No. I mean, there's a, there's a sheep view camera on a sheep. I, I what had more can you say? I had to include the story to wipe away the bad taste of the Pokemon <laughs> Go story. All right. <laughs> good call. Good call. The Olympics start Friday. NBC will broadcast over 6,755 hours of programming. That would take you a lot of time to watch. But if you're a cord cutter, will you be able to watch any of it? You can find out after the break. But first, let's take a minute to thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans, the sponsor of this episode. Getting a mortgage is super frustrating. I just want to move in and sit on the porch, not spend days buried under paperwork. Rocket Mortgage brings the mortgage approval process into the 21st century. It's fast, it's powerful, and it's completely online. Rocket Mortgage has taken all the complicated, time-consuming parts of applying for a mortgage out of the equation. Hate searching through stacks of old files and paperwork? With Rocket Mortgage, you can easily share your bank statements and pay stubs at the touch of a button, helping you get approved in minutes for a custom mortgage solution that's been tailored to your unique financial situation. Even better, with Rocket Mortgage, you can do all of this on your phone or your tablet. It's a quick online process that you can manage from the convenience of your couch. So if you are looking to refinance your mortgage or buy a home, check out Rocket Mortgage today at quickenloans.com slash TNT. That's quickenloans.com slash TNT. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLS, consumer access.org number 3030 and we thank rocket mortgage by quicken loans for their support the olympics start this friday and for the first time ever nbc who owns the rights is loosening their death grip on distributing content joining us to talk about this is kurt wagner reporter at recode welcome kurt hi megan so tell us about the deal that was announced three months ago with snapchat let's start there Sure. So uh, a few months ago, uh, NBC said that they were going to share some of their highlights onto Snapchat. And as part of the deal, BuzzFeed was going to kind of manage a, a Snapchat Discover channel for NBC, create the packages. Um, and then NBC, of course, would would say, uh, you know, thumbs up. Yes, you can use these highlights, which are really valuable, by the way. NBC, uh, NBC pays billions of dollars for the rights to uh, kind of own this content. And so even highlights were things that they never shared on any property that was not NBC owned. Um, so that was a big deal. And that was uh, a few months ago. And since then, they've uh, recently announced another deal with Facebook and Instagram um, to share highlights over there as well. So the, we kind of are seeing the dissemination of, uh, of this content, which again, NBC has paid a lot of money to, to own. So will they be using their live streaming feature to show the highlights? So this isn't going to be live in the way that we have been hearing a lot about uh, what Twitter's doing. So um, you're not necessarily going to tune in and watch an actual competition live on Facebook or Snapchat. Instead, you would see uh, stuff after the fact. But again, like that just goes to show you how, how uh, I guess, important these highlights are to NBC, right? That, that even the fact that, that they're handing over highlights is a big deal. Um, that kind of tells you a little something. So they were not willing to hand over the live streams. Those are the really valuable uh, part that they want everyone to tune in to watch on television. So you mentioned what Twitter is doing, but you mean what Twitter is doing with the NFL. Uh, you don't mean uh, t Twitter doesn't have a deal with the Olympics, do they? Sorry, no, they don't. Yeah, I was referring to, to what Twitter is doing, not only with the NFL, but um, with a bunch of other partners. They're trying to create kind of this, you know, pseudo um, cable network, if you will, where they offer a bunch of different live streaming stuff. Um, this is different than that. And again, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, NBC does not have a deal with Twitter. Um, in fact, that's kind of the one platform they were not able to get a deal together with. Even though they will share um, some highlights to Twitter, they will share some content to Twitter. Uh, it's going to be very different than what you're going to see them do with uh, Facebook, Instagram, um, or with Snapchat. So do you think it was, uh, was it Twitter that uh, didn't want, I mean, who, who was, was it NBC that didn't think Twitter was a valuable platform? Do you know how, anything about the deal? Man, you are, you're asking the right question. And it's one that I've asked as well, uh, without much luck of getting an answer, but I know that they talked. Um, I know that when we reported about Snapchat and NBC coming together, they were in talks with both Facebook and Twitter, something materialized with Facebook. It didn't with Twitter or, uh, it didn't with Twitter. I imagine I'm, I'm totally guessing. I imagine there was some kind of hang up over, uh, either how the money was going to be distributed or what they would be able to sell against the the uh, highlights versus not sell. I honestly do not know. Um, but the fact that they didn't come to an agreement is kind of surprising given uh, I know that, you know, it, it seems like these are usually win-win for both sides. I, I, I can't imagine what kept them from doing it, but something did. 
Yeah, it really seemed kind of made, you know, tailor made for kind of Twitter's momentum in this thing that they've got going on right now. It's a missed opportunity for sure. Now, I cut the cord a couple of months ago, and since then, a lot of things have happened on TV that I want to watch. Um, so basically, what I what I feel like I and fear that I'm hearing here is that okay, there's clips, there's preview, uh, you know, kind of highlights and all that kind of stuff that I, as a total cord cutter. Uh, could could potentially have access to, but no live streaming of events in full. That's going to be next impossible for me. That's my understanding. So you're going to be able to watch it digitally through, I think it's NBCOlympics.com. They have an NBC Olympics app. Um, and so there's a lot of ways you could watch it on like an iPad or an iPhone or even through like Apple TV. Um, my understanding, though, is if you actually want to watch the good stuff, which is the actual competitions, um, you still need to authenticate, which means you would have to log in with your cable subscription, uh, you know, username and password. So you're going to be able on a Facebook or a Snapchat to see what happened a couple hours ago, and you're going to probably see a lot of free uh, talking heads, a lot of analysis. Um, <laughs> but if you want to see the the real stuff, you're probably going to have to pay, uh, uh, you know, have NBC subscription, um, cable subscription in some way, shape, or form. Mm. <laughs> I know. Boo. But yeah. that's why they paid. That's I think life. they paid like yeah. $4 billion for the rights to stream this. And uh, it probably wouldn't be uh, making a lot. Uh, it for wouldn't sure. be very good business to give it away for free. So Absolutely. I, I mean, I'm wondering if this is, I mean, Olympics used to, back in my day, the Olympics <laughs> used to be such a big deal. I mean, just, but I don't know if people are that interested in then There's so much, you know, controversy surrounding this, you know, this Olympics. And there's doping and, the, you know, they're, you know, do we really want our athletes out there when the pollution is so bad? I mean, I'm wondering, do you, do you see this as a generational switch that younger people are not interested or is it, is the same interest there? I, I'm I'm with you. I think it's just gotten to be too big of business. Um, it's you mentioned doping. I mean, Russia's going through some doping issues. I remember uh, a couple years ago with China, there were all these issues with like their you know the Chinese gymnastics team was. It seemed like all the girls on the team were like eight years old. Um, this year, there's a bunch of top athletes in in golf and and uh, you know LeBron James isn't playing for the NBA. Neither is Steph Curry. Like people don't want to go to to Brazil because they don't want to risk the Zika virus that's been going on. So like there's a lot of things that are happening that, that are making it, I think less appealing than it has been in the past, but none of it in my opinion is worse than the business side and how, and how this has just become a big moneymaker. And it no longer feels like it's truly the place for the top athletes in the world to come and represent their country so much as it is a great marketing opportunity for NBC and for, uh, you know, all of their big brand partners who want to be involved. And, I don't remember the exact um, outlet, but I want to say um, the Olympic uh, committee sent out an email to a bunch of brands and was like, hey, if you sponsor an athlete, but it's not you're not an official Olympic sponsor, you're not allowed to even like use certain hashtags on Twitter. So you couldn't say like, hey, we're proud of our, you know, our, our long distance runner, so and so hashtag Olympic Games like you could get in trouble for doing that <laughs> because you're not an official Olympic sponsor. And it's just ridiculous that this is all boiled down to, uh, you know, who can make the most money off of off of this. And we're not even, like I said, I'm bummed because we're not even seeing the best players in the NBA. We're not seeing the best golfers in the world. Um, this is not a reflection of of the best competition out there. And I think a lot of it has to do with uh, with corporate, you know, greed. If I can get off my soapbox here, but that's a that's a big bummer to me. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, we talk about Twitter, whether they didn't want it. I mean, I'm, I'm interested because, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the political race, the U.S. presidential race is just like probably all Twitter needs at this point. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's a competition that we're all watching unfold and fall apart. And, you know, oftentimes, it, you know, it is comes at the same year as the Olympics. So it's, it's the Olympics are often like a more uplifting thing to watch than the, uh, than the political con contest, which we definitely need this year. So, so maybe we'll have that. Uh, how are you going to watch it? Uh, uh, I will probably still watch on the big screen. Uh, by the big screen, I mean the television I have in my living room. Um, but I was surprised at how much I enjoyed watching, uh, uh, you mentioned the convention stuff or the political stuff, um, even though I think that if NBC was streaming actual competitions, I might be inclined to watch on a Twitter or Facebook because I did enjoy seeing the live conversation directly beside the uh, the content of the conventions. Unfortunately, that's not available. So because of that, 
I'll probably watch on television. I don't really like watching sports on a phone. It's a little too small for me. Um, so I'll probably uh, stick with the uh, traditional route. But um, we'll see. I don't know how much of it uh, I'm going to watch in general, to be totally honest with you. I, I'm normally much more excited for the Olympics. And, and this year, some about it. I'm, I'm not quite as jazzed as I used to be. I must be sad from all the politics that's happening. That's, that's the only explanation. <laughs> yeah. Well, Kurt, thank you so much for joining us. Kurt is a reporter at Recode.net, and he is Kurt Wagner 8 on Twitter. Thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Kurt. Care. All right, Try McNox or McNux writes, <laughs> I was listening to your podcast at work here in Kuwait, and uh, I heard you mention that both you guys would switch platforms for a week. I was forced to use my wife's iPhone for two weeks and got to know iOS. I have since converted my wife to use Android, and it took her about two weeks before she got used to having so many options. I believe as tech journalists, two weeks should be the required amount of time to switch platforms and see the immediate downsides and the eventual upside of both platforms. So please, if you can, do your due diligence and try switching for two weeks. It's a really good point. Um, I know when I get a phone to review sometimes, you know, like sometimes you get that phone and you want to get a review out right away, but sometimes a week is not enough. Sometimes you need to live with it a little bit more. And even a phone that you buy, you don't notice certain things about it for like a month. And then a month in, you're like, yeah, you know, this has been really great. But there's this one thing that I've realized is bugging me. Uh, so we should consider that. Yeah. I, I think that makes makes sense to do it a little bit longer. I feel like the first week is getting used to the things that are different. And the second week might just be like living with it. Admit it. You just want my iPhone for two weeks. I, how about a month? <laughs> yeah, no. How about a full year, Megan? Let's no, up maybe, the ante. Maybe we should do a month. I don't know. So <laughs> we were going to wait for Nougat, pronounced yeah. Nougat, mm -hmm. uh, which is allegedly coming out maybe this week, maybe. August 6th. So, maybe. We'll yeah. find out. Yeah. And we so. don't even know yeah, what devices it's rolling out to immediately. Probably the Nexus device you can imagine. But we'll figure it out. Very good point, though. Maybe a longer term uh, it would be beneficial to that experiment. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to it, though. All right, coming up, we'll chat a bit about the bumpy road to chip card here in the U.S. But first, let's take a minute to thank Tracker, the sponsor of this episode. With advancements in technology, we have all sorts of smart things that we rely on. Smart cars, smart phones, particularly smart homes. Losing your possessions, the things that you own in life, make you feel not so smart. And Tracker then makes losing those things a thing of the past. I have a tracker in my backpack. It means that I will never lose my backpack. And if I do, I'm going to know exactly where it is. Or if I leave the, the house without it and I need it for work, I get that separation alert. I know I can go back and get it. It's just tucked away, totally working for me, and I don't even know that it's there anymore. Coin size device locates misplaced keys, uh, wallets, computers, can even track pets in seconds. The Tracker Bravo is constructed with an anodized aluminum for the thinnest and most durable tracking. Uh, you can pair Tracker to your iOS or Android device, attach to anything with a key loop or adhesive, and find its precise location with the tap of a button. And that's really all there is to it. You can also customize the two-way separation alert that I was talking about. That, that way you're going to receive notifications before you leave your item behind. And if you happen to lose your phone on the other end, you just find the tracker, you press the button, and that's going to ring your phone even when it's on silent. Very handy. With over 1.5 million devices, Tracker has the largest crowd GPS network in the world. So your lost item shows up on a map, even if it's miles away. And if an item goes missing, the Tracker app records its last known location on a map. And then when another Tracker user comes within a 100-foot range of your lost item, you're going to receive a GPS update of where your item's located. Your phone can actually track up to 10 devices at once. And this tracker enabled by Bluetooth Low Energy, LE, so the battery lasts up to one year. There are water-resistant cases, and that's perfect for things like pet collars that might get a little messy. It'll protect the tracker. You can even add a laser-engraved message to Tracker Bravo, like the return information or pet information. And now, new at Tracker is their custom image printing. I actually have it right here. Uh, they sent us a few of these where you can personalize your tracker with a custom printed image. And I think I recognize that logo. I think it might be the Tech News Today logo. It absolutely is. Very, very cool. They just slap that right on there, and it's custom to you. Tracker Atlas, which works with your Tracker Bravo or third-party Bluetooth tracker, uh, can pinpoint your items on a customizable floor plan of your home, so you can save time and energy. All you have to do is ask Tracker Atlas where your item is, You'll get an answer instantly, and you don't need to search for it. So go to thetracker.com 
You'll never lose your possessions again. That's what it's all about. Plus, just for our audience, if you enter promo code TNT, you're going to get 30% off your entire order. That's T-H-E-T-R-A-C-K-R.com, promo code TNT, for 30% off your entire Tracker order. We thank Tracker for their support. All right, I've had all of my credit and debit cards replaced over the past year or so with ones that include that little chip on the front. I'd show you, except... I'm not going to do that <laughs> for obvious reasons. I hope for the world, for a world where things got easier, but that's just not the case at all. Joining us to talk a bit about the chip card transition is Ian Carr from Quartz. How's it going, Ian? Hey, thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's great to have you back. Uh, yeah. I was out the last time you were on, so it's good to see you. Uh, so uh, first, how is chip card supposed to make transactions more secure and hopefully a little bit easier? What's its so promise? It's it's almost like two-factor authentication, except with your credit card. The MagStripe card, which most of us are very familiar with, essentially it's it's pretty dumb. You just swipe it and it spits out your credit card number. Um, with the chip card, it's supposed to serve as like another authentication layer. So it, there are two different ways. One is you can authenticate with the signature, which is where you sign the receipt, which is what most of us do in the states. Another way is when you add a uh, you type in a, a four-digit PIN code. So if, for, so if you have a debit card. That's uh, you're pretty familiar with that then, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So in the U.S., we've pr primarily been using chip and sig, uh, which is a signature authentication, which is uh, just one of the many problems with the U.S. rollout uh, for the chip card. So then, how how is this different than uh, other places where this actually works pretty well? I mean, my if I had to summarize my experience with chip over the past year, it's been an experience filled with like doubt that it's going to work, uh, uncertainty on what to use. The things there but you know and it, and it obviously takes a chip card but then i'm told no just swipe it anyways like why is it failing here and it's working elsewhere there are a lot of different there are a lot of different reasons why i think one the main reason is that there wasn't a strong incentive in the u.s in the uk and other countries that have rolled out the chip card i mean even 10 years ago 10 uk shifted in ten, uh, about a decade ago uh, that, that only happened because of a government mandate and that's because the government said, hey, we need to improve our security. We need to improve our um, payment infrastructure. So they told merchants and banks to uh, unilaterally adopt chip and pin. That's very different than what happened in the U.S. In the U.S., everyone just agreed on a uh, almost uh, there was no mandate at all. It was something called a liability shift that went into effect October 1st, 2015. What that was was uh, basically banks right now cover you for all fraud that happens on your card. What the bank said was that if a merchant doesn't have the necessary equipment up and running um, for chip cards, then the, li the fraud liability is on them. So let's say the Target hack happened post uh, liability shift, Target would be on the hook for all of that money that that, that customers oh, lost. Wow. And for, for retailers, that, that could, for big retailers like Target and Best Buy and Home Depot, that could really add up. And uh, so that's why a lot of the big retailers, Walmart, for instance, uh, they were all really quick to adopt chip cards. The only problem is once you trickle down into the medium-sized merchants and the small businesses like the mom-and-pop shops, they don't really deal with that much fraud. So they don't. there wasn't a really strong incentive for them to uh, update their terminals, pay thousands of dollars for these new payment equipment for a marginal uh, marginal gain. And what, so they, what they said was that, you know what, screw it, we're not going to update, we're just going to deal with the minimal fraud that we have and that's why in some stores you'll go to you'll go and you're, you'll be swiping and then another store you'll be inserting your card and it's caused a lot of confusion um for instance i was at a cvs recently where i had to swipe because for some reason the, the dip card the dipping mechanism wasn't working and there are just all these sort of weird confusions on the con on the consumer side that really just stem from the fact that this was really poorly planned rollout uh by the networks and the banks yeah, and I also feel I felt since since Chip has been rolling out this like layer of uh, I don't know like you go through the song and dance you try and try and do it and then it beeps loud it's almost like you're being shamed you did the wrong thing or you didn't put it in you know far enough or whatever and it's like this it's actually kind of a jolting experience in some places you try and it, do it right and it yells at you it's kind of weird <laughs> and I mean I I've been doing norm, uh, recently I'm just asking like hey, do I swipe or do I dip it? Which right. is like adding a couple more seconds to the process. And I mean, yeah, obviously it's not that difficult to make payments in the U.S., but every second counts if you're a retailer. The bigger the retail, retailer you are, the more the, the lo and the longer checkout experience, the more frustrated your customers are going to be. And it's going to hurt your, uh, your bottom line at the end of the day. 
So it actually, um, during the holiday season, a lot of big retailers decided to shut off their EMV because they didn't want to add any uh, checkout time uh, because they wanted their customers to get in and out as fast as possible. So they actually shut it off and didn't worry about fraud because they understood that it was a really poor customer experience. Because every single time you do this, if it tacks on even three, four, five, ten seconds, depending on how, you know, especially during a holiday season, like that adds, you know, that just aggregates quickly and suddenly that could potentially mean a lot longer lines just because of this new technology. Now, what about chip readers in restaurants and bars? This is a kind of an aspect that I hadn't thought of before reading your piece, but uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, that, yeah, it's actually pretty funny. I was sitting in a bar one day right after the, uh, the, the liability shift, and I was like, wait, none of the bars that I go to are actually dipping my card. They're still swiping it like normal. So I talked to a bunch of bar owners, and they said that if you just, if you, what they told me was that if you add a chip card uh, reader, it creates a, a complete logistical nightmare behind the scenes on how a bar normally operates. Uh, for, some, for some cases, the software wasn't ready to support EMV, uh, the chip card and bar tabs so that they would have to revert to like, you know, tallying bar tabs uh, with pen and paper. And if you're a New York City bar on a Friday night, you don't want to be, you know, tallying the bar tabs with pen and paper. Uh, it's, it would be too much of a nightmare. And then also the ordering process. Let's say you sit at a bar uh, with your friends, and then you guys go to one of the tables and eat at a restaurant. You have to do almost uh, you have to do two separate transactions, and uh, and it just causes a uh, kind of a logistical nightmare if you want to have uh, chip readers at a bar. So a lot. Mm. So um, I spoke to dozens of bars, and not one of them uh, updated their chip cards by. Uh, uh, and they most of them said that they weren't even wasn't even very high on their radar. It wasn't a big point of concern for them. Well, that's where we, I mean, that's the craziest thing when you ever talk, when you talk about credit cards versus like something like Apple Pay or something, um, you know, we're handing over our credit card to bartenders or waiters. You know, they're taking it into the back room. We don't see it. So, I mean, we're, we're getting, we're sort of used to it. Retail uh, places not handing over our card anymore, just swiping mm -hmm. it ourselves. But, you know, we, I guess we're all as a society completely comfortable with handing over our cards and letting them, someone take it um, at restaurants and bars. Because that's the that's the choice we have, you know. <laughs> so we, I mean, other than of course bringing in cash, I suppose. Cash? Yeah. yeah. What is that? <laughs> I know, right? Well, actually, a lot of bars that I spoke to said that they were much more interested in adding uh, Apple Pay and mobile yeah. wallets in their restaurants and bars. So let's there would be a little NFC re, uh, receiver, uh, you know, spread out throughout the bar. And there are a bunch of really interesting small startups that are trying to uh, solve a lot of the the bar tab and. Uh, the nightlife and restaurant management systems for uh, EMV uh, and chip card uh, and uh, readers, and uh, a lot of them are focused on Las Vegas clubs and, and uh, uh, you know Las Vegas clubs that are uh, that are seeing a slight increase in uh, fraud um, since the shift. Apparently, that's what they've told me. So they're trying to figure out how to deal with that without making it making it a com complete uh, nightmarish experience for the customer. Yeah, I can imagine with the with the mobile payments, like I've thought about that. The, the only way that you do that in a bar or particularly in a restaurant where you're sitting at a table, like right now we're so used to sitting at a table, handing the cart, the, the method of payment to the person, they walk away with it, but you don't necessarily do that with your phone. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like they have to have the technology, the infrastructure to be able to bring that to the table. And that's just part of what they do. So that actually takes a shift in kind of their approach and, and an upfront investment in the technology to do that. But uh, that makes a, I don't know, makes a lot more sense to me too. Um, so, are we just are we just going to slog, slog through this whole chip thing for the next couple of years before we finally get it right? Is there any sign of of finally <laughs> reaching that point that uh, those in like the UK and other places that have been doing this for ten plus years, like it's blissful there? Why not here? When do we, when do we get bliss? I don't I don't think it'll take ten years. I'll say that okay. I think right. it'll, it'll, it'll be about a year or two before uh, things get. Uh, before almost all merchants accept EMV cards. I think one of the saving graces of this whole thing is that all these EMV readers, these chip card readers that uh, these merchants are updating to, they support Apple Pay and mobile wallets too. So if, you're, if you have a phone that supports that, um, you, can, you have a really seamless checkout experience. Sure. And, uh, and I think that's going to be a big, uh, you know, this EMV shift could be, uh, this chip card shift could be a real big driver for mobile wallet usage in the States. Uh, and um, it's, you kind of see it happening with the UK already. The UK has had this entire chip infrastructure with NFC technology baked into the terminals. And now, over the past year or so, 
uh, contactless payments has been taking off there. So that's uh, it's been really interesting to see how, because they had the groundwork laid out, um, NFC payments are, are really taking off. And, you know, a lot of people think that uh, a similar kind of trend could happen in the U.S. So it's not going to, it's getting better slowly. It's probably going to be about another six months to a year before uh, things are really, you know, you're paying with your chip card, you're dipping your chip card everywhere. So there's no more confusion and things like that. Yeah, six six months to a year more of that that reader burping at me when I do it wrong <laughs> and making me feel like a jerk. That's, that's a little optimistic, but right. yeah, that, uh, that'd be that's that's what I'm hopeful for. Hopefully, we'll get right. up by then. All right, I'm hopeful too. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. As always, Ian Carr uh, from Quartz. Tell people where they can follow all your work online. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, Ian Carr uh, underscore, and uh, you can read me on uh, Kizzy.com. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Ian. We'll thank talk you. to you soon. Thanks a lot, guys. All right, see you. TNT's fan of the day is Grandma Mess, who yeah. sent us an email to say she's been watching us from her hammock. From her hammock. Oh, that see, that, that's relaxing. Yeah. A little hammock, a little tech news. I, I want a hammock. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. <sighs> I <do> Just, too. <laughs> who doesn't want a hammock? Uh, record a, a video, one. take a picture of yourself or your setup in your hammock, post it on Instagram, Google, Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube. Use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT and we will find it. After the break, Jason really wanted to talk about the fingerprints of a dead guy, so I let him Aww. because that's what friends are for. Mm. <laughs> Put it that way. <laughs> but first, <laughs> let's take a minute to thank Trunk Club, the sponsor of this episode. Summer is here. It's time to spruce up your wardrobe with summer essentials like short sleeve button downs, lightweight blazers, and swimwear. Whether you're looking for beach formal attire or grown up graphic tees, Trunk Club is a shopping game changer for men and for women. With Trunk Club, you'll never have to step foot inside a store for your clothing needs again. Plus, you get your very own personal stylist for free. Just type in your measurements and share your style and spending preferences to connect with the right Trunk Club stylist. He or she will contact you via phone, email, or messenger to understand your unique look and learn more about what you are looking for. Your stylist will select items for your trunk from over 80 top brands, and they'll send you a preview of the clothes that may be a good fit for you. Then you review your trunk via email, make edits before it's right to your door. You'll have 10 days to try on the clothes, keep what you like, and send back the rest. Trunk Club is not a subscription service and shipping is always free, both ways. Premium clothes, expert advice, no work, thanks to your very own personal stylist at Trunk Club. Trunk Club is backed by Nordstrom, which means they have the highest standards in quality and customer service. And if you live in Dallas, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, or D.C., you can stop by one of the Trunk Club clubhouses, and there you can work with your stylist in person for free. Make a statement at the next big event on your calendar with a look that's handpicked just for you and your style. Get started today at trunkclub.com slash TNT. Look and feel your best with clothes that fit you perfectly. That's trunkclub.com slash TNT, and we thank Trunk Club for their support. All right. <laughs> How secure is fingerprint security? Really? <laughs> All right, check this out. Researchers at Michigan State University were enlisted to help Michigan police attempt to access a Samsung Galaxy S6 that was determined to be uh, to belong to a murder victim. Police wanted access, uh, kind of in the hopes that it might contain information that could help identify who the murderer was. Using his fingers actually won't work because the technology requires not only the fingerprint pattern, but also an electrical circuit. Uh, like live fingerprints provide. And so just having like a fingerprint to do that with isn't going to help. The team had already tried 3D printing the fingerprints to no avail, to, like 3D printing a finger to try that. Uh, so they went back to the drawing board and 2D printed a version of the fingerprint after doing some touch-ups. So they went in and kind of like completed the lines of the fingerprint or whatever. I just kind of find this, this story fascinating. Uh, but this time with conductive ink. And doing so, they put it on the fingerprint reader unlock the device. So the S6 apparently didn't have a maximum number of attempts speed bump, which I know on iOS, I think that's baked in, right? We talked a lot about that with the San Bernardino case a few months back. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Anil Jain, who, who worked on this, told NPR his hopes uh, that this shows people just kind of the limits of fingerprint locks on phones, that it's not nearly as secure. You know, there are ways around it 
conductive ink apparently is one way around it. All you need is like a, photo a photograph of a fingerprint and conductive ink, and that can get you in. This is kind of crazy. Well, the thing with the iPhone is that if you uh, don't unlock it for 24 hours, you can't use your fingerprint. You have to use the password. So you have to do But so if But if there's repeated events and it's yeah, incorrect, then there's yeah. something something that uh, that keeps you out. Right. But apparently was, that wasn't here. But. Yeah. There was a recent story because, I mean, they're, they're also the issue is, um, you know, can you incriminate yourself? So, like, mm -hmm. you can't give up your – you don't have to give up your password because that's incriminating yourself. And, you that's know, knowledge. Giving, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's your stuff inside your brain. You don't have to give it up. Um, but the thumbprint, that's the gray area. And some judges now are saying, like, that it is – you know, they do have the right to demand someone's fingerprint. Uh, so, yeah, but but they the, in the case that happened last week, I think, they demanded it. But by the time – they couldn't get in there because by the time right. they went through all the legal rigmarole – it had been, you know, the phone had been off for, I think, I can't remember if it's 24 or 48 hours, but it, it, after that, you have to use your you password and you can't use your fingerprint. With the pin, yeah. And uh, basically, the professor also recommends kind of just in general, the numerical passcode is the strongest protection because, like you said, that's that's stored up here in your brain and uh, you can't be compelled to give it. So uh, just a little reminder. And I suppose the other the other overarching point here is that the deceased have no right to privacy. Mm. Basically, <laughs> basically, once... Once you pass away or once you die, um, your device can be broken into. Like there, there is no respect to privacy because you're not a living being anymore, at least here in the States. So, huh. Yeah. So keep that in mind. I don't know how that's useful, but there you go. Mm, apparently. <laughs> All right, Brian. Forever, Brian. <coughs> TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be a part of the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv. You can leave us a short voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW, and you can hit us up on Twitter. We're at Tech News Today TV. What we would love you to do is subscribe to our show. You can find all the ways at twit.tv slash TNT. And if you want to find me on Twitter, I am there at Megan Maroney. I'm there too, but not at Megan Maroney. I'm at Jason Howell. Thanks to our technical director, Brian. Thanks to Greg for the words, the Burnett brothers in effect. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everyone.